again to AAUW diversity committees, racism discussion series, as many, if not most of you know already, AAUW, the acronym stands for the American Association of University Women. We were um, created in 1881 with a mission to advance equity for women and girls. We believe at AAUW that equity for women leads to equity for everyone. Um, so we are pleased to launch this particular discussion series. Um, Today we are going to be using, and let me share my screen real quick. There it is. In our plan for today, we will be again using anonymous polling and breakout rooms. So let's make sure that our technology is gonna work for us. This meeting is rooms, um, and what you will see on your screen is an invitation to join a breakout room, and you need to click on that invitation to join the group. You, your microphone will be muted as you go into the breakout room, so you will need to click on your mic to unmute it, and you'll see where that unmute button is. You will not need to raise your electronic hand in the breakout groups. After 15 minutes, the host will bring you back to the main session. And when you return to the large group, your mic will automatically be muted. These are our basic discussion ground rules. We ask that we, each person keep comments and questions to two minutes. We ask that you speak to the entire online audience and be respectful of other people's comments because we are dealing with topics that are hard to talk about. We want to be sure to avoid blame, shame, guilt, or preaching. And we can certainly disagree, but to do it without being disagreeable. So here, here is our agenda for today. Linda, excuse me, Linda. I'm yeah. sorry. You went quickly past technical. I have one technical uh, reminder. Okay. Uh, going back to the large groups, when you raise your hand, uh, your, your name will go in the order in which you raised it. And before you are at, when there is a speaker before you, you'll get a message that says, asks you to unmute. In order for this to run smoothly, please just keep a, an eye out on your little picture. When we ask you to unmute, unmute yourself so that when the first person is finished speaking, we can call on you to smoothly be the next speaker. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. You're welcome. Okay, um, so today's agenda, we're gonna watch a short video. We will take a quick anonymous poll and then move into the breakout groups. When we come back, we'll have an opportunity for anyone who cares to, to share aha moments from the breakout group. And we will then engage in large group discussion and finally wrap up. Today, we are discussing implicit bias. And in preparation, we asked people to view some videos and to take Harvard's implicit association test. So to help everyone have some similar information in the breakout rooms, we're gonna look very quickly at one of the short videos we asked you uh, to watch in preparation for the scene, for the session today. Um, let me remind people too that we've extended the time to 12.30 because we've tended to run over in every session so far. So hang on and let me shift gears here. Okay, that's done. <laughs> Just a moment. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. 
Yeah, so when Hillary Clinton mentioned implicit bias in the debates, our phones started blowing up, mm. all our friends started emailing us about it. But what is implicit bias? Implicit biases are basically thought processes that happen without you even knowing it. Little mental shortcuts that hold judgments you might not agree with. And sometimes the shortcuts are based on race. First, some clarity. Saying someone has an implicit bias is different from calling someone a racist. The word racist is a highly loaded term right here in American society. A lot of times when people are using it, they're thinking of the kind of old fashioned Ku Klux Klan style racist. But implicit bias isn't anywhere near that, you know, explicit. Implicit bias is something that comes out of ordinary mental functioning, out of how the mind normally works. We've all grown up in a culture with media images, news images, conversations we heard at home, our education. Think of that as a fog we've been breathing our whole life. We never even realized it, what we were taking in. And that fog causes associations that lead to biases. I somehow know that if you say peanut butter, I'm gonna say jelly. That's an association that's been ingrained in me because throughout my life, peanut butter and jelly are together. And in many forms of media, there is an over-representation of black men and violent crime being paired together. And because of that, I actually deep down inside have been taught that black men are violent and aggressive and not to be trusted, that they're criminals, that they're thugs. With all those associations, I'm not trying to let us off the hook, but in some ways, none of us stood a chance. Starting today, we'll post a video a day dealing with one challenge of understanding implicit bias and its relationship to race and exploring ways we might combat the problem. One more thing, if you're seeing this and thinking that it doesn't apply to you, well, you might be falling prey to the blind spot bias. That's the scientific name for a mental bias that allows you to see biases in others, but not in yourself. We're biased. <gasps> So that was one of the videos that we had asked you to watch ahead of time. But we wanted to, uh, hang on, I, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Hold on, there we go, okay. Um, where was I? Okay. You couldn't walk and chew gum. Yeah, you notice I can barely do those things individually. Um, we okay. I to share the video with you to help you get oriented. Thank you very much. Notice it takes a whole team. Although many of you may have viewed that video before, um, we wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to see it um, so that we're kind of on the same ground. Before we go into breakout rooms, we have a quick little poll that we would like you to take. Um, Jackie, are you, there it is. Okay, hang on, because I've also got a share screen. Just a moment. We're supposed to answer these? Just a moment. Yes, you are. Oh. And I'm having a little difficulty here. Hang on. So why don't we, the, the question is, if you took Harvard's implicit association test, were you surprised by the result? And the answers are yes, no, or didn't take it. Um, what I was trying to get to. <clears throat> It's not wanting to behave. Okay. So that's everybody. Okay. 15 out of 2016. Uh, I think three of us are doing it oh. because we're hosts. Right. We're but you've got 100% okay. there. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Right. Share. May I share? Please do. 
Oh. So it's interesting. Um, we would encourage you to go ahead and take it um, because it it's an interesting experience and they are collecting data. So there is the Harvard test. Um, we'll come back to that in a bit. Okay. Um, I can't tell. Hang on. Technical difficulties. One that. And that's not the sign. So perhaps Here we are, the breakout group, group discussions. I knew I would get back to it eventually. There you are. Okay. Um, we're going to go into the breakout groups. And in each group, we want you to discuss or share your reactions to the preparatory videos and or your reactions to the implicit association test. Um, a little better than half of us took that. Um, and all of you have seen at least one of the videos. So without further ado, I am going to take this down and put people into breakout rooms. You're going to see a little blue link that asks you to join a breakout. To actually formally report out from breakout groups. Uh, some of you may have, have done that if you use breakout groups in conferences or educational settings. But we're, we're thinking that the kinds of things that people say in small groups um, may be more personal than needs to happen in the large group. So if you feel comfortable and would like to uh, share some of your own aha moments in the breakout group, raise your electronic hand and Jackie will control your muting and unmuting, and you will have an opportunity to speak. So let me unshare. There we go. So anybody feeling bold, care to say anything about the discussion that you had? Anything about the um, IAT? Nancy Hartshorn. There. Oh, just that a couple of us we're identifying that we think we're making changes in our attitudes already uh, based on, in my case, the lectures that I've listened to, these four lectures, or the other three, I guess, so far. And I think one of the other people is on your committee, so she's had bigger input. But thank you for the oh, experience to make a difference in myself. Nancy, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, on the committee, we've wondered. Um, so it's good to hear that kind of feedback. Very cool. Thank you. Judy, Bon. Yes, well, I have um, a couple of things. Am I unmuted? You are I unmuted. Video. Okay. Um, I was surprised that there are more people than I thought whose children would, would intermarry. I thought perhaps I, I was the only one. I didn't have uh, the time, there was no time in the uh, breakout group to tell them my story, but uh, my son has never really shown a preference for white girls. Uh, he, he has always pretty much dated interracially. And um, he ha had married a girl from Mexico. They, have, they had two children and she had one that she came to the marriage with. All of my grandchildren are adorable. They're all beautiful and dark with dark hair. And, you know, they, they all look Hispanic. And it never bothered me, really. It never, I, I never even really noticed because they were mine. Um, and and I, I don't know now. Uh, oh, and, and now that he, he's getting divorced and, uh, no, he's dating quite seriously a Chinese woman. So I, I can't explain it. It's a little surprising, but I've learned 
talk about changing attitudes. I've learned to take all that in stride and say, oh, one time in a fit of anger <laughs> for something else, I said to him, can't you ever find a nice white girl? But that was out of line and, and I apologized for it because I don't think he can. He, seem, he seems to enjoy the differences and I, I don't know, maybe he's got, maybe he knows something I don't. But I think that it's becoming a situation where most of us are mixed in some way and we, if everybody else is like me, as I said, I never really noticed those children were precious to me, even the one that wasn't mine. And of course we lost one, so. Uh, but I, I just made a large donation to St. Jude's in her name. So, I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I don't know, attitudes change, they change slowly. And mine certainly is. Good to know, Judy. Thank you. Ask Why me. are you snickering? <laughs> uh, was that a snicker? I don't know. I thought it was sort of like. No, okay. it, was, it was a thank you. Uh, well, thank you. For one one thing. thought that crosses my mind, a good friend of ours from the town that we, we lived in up north was a, a Latina. And she was uh, very active in uh, civic engagement and things like that. And she married a fellow who was on the faculty in the English department who happened to be a black man. Somebody asked her at one time about her mixed race relationship. And her, re her reaction to that was, it, we're one race, we're the human race. Um, and at, which I, at the time I thought was a, a pretty advanced thought, but um, to me at the moment, it's, it's kind of echoing the sorts of things that you're yeah. saying, Judy. So um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Espy. Yes. Um, yeah, I'd like to share something about the peanut butter and jelly. <laughs> <laughs> This is one of them. Anyway, why does it strike me? When I see peanut butter, I don't associate it with jelly. I'm going to try something else. Maybe this time I'll try bananas. Maybe next time I'll have apple. And I seem to like the result. So it doesn't automatically get in my mind. I'll grab a jelly to, to do that. Well, saying that, when I was a young woman in my travels in the past, I thought there was some, uh, I didn't recognize it at that point in time, it's implicit bias. I guess it's just different type of people. When I was in Italy, they say, oh, the Southern Italians are aggressive. They're brown, they're this, they're that. And the Northern Italians are light uh, in color, blonde, and very more uh, gentle. So for me, I think I'd like to see it. They're ignorant, you know, it's not guilty until you've proven guilty. I, I explore both areas and put that decision for myself and my judgment. Oh yeah, they're a little dark, they're a little this, they're a little that. What seems to, I got out of it, I says, I don't prejudge it. Let me just get to know when I meet people in different places and what. Let me just get to know them first. Then I form my own opinion. So I don't know if there's some of those opinions are preconceived or not. Maybe some are influenced preconceived because when I was growing up, where I grew up, if you come from the north, you're this, and if you come from the south, you're that. And uh, I seem to experience that in other countries as well as I was traveling, you know, north, south, or whatever it is. Well, even here in the villages, if you live in the north, you must be over 75, you might be 80 or so thereabouts. If you live in the south, you must be over in your 60s. So there are some, I don't know if that is a bias or if that is just facts. Yeah, that's just what I would say. Thank you. Um, and, it, and it's interesting, my dad um, was physiologically incapable of cooking. But when it was his turn to make sure that we were fed, he offered peanut butter and banana sandwiches, which 
to this day, I consistently reject, but also peanut butter and jelly. The jelly and the banana would be okay. It's the peanut butter I object to. That's just me. Thank you. Um, Peg. Yes. Um, so many white people seem to object to interracial uh, marriages or relationships. And I do not understand that concept. It, your love life or your personal life makes no difference to me. It, uh, it's not a threat to me in any way who you choose to uh, date or marry or hang out with. In fact, I'd like to see more of it happening and then maybe there wouldn't be so many uh, people who are either black or white. We'd all be a mixture. And then maybe some of this racism would start to go away. Got our fingers crossed, Peg, and we're, we're doing, I'm not sure it's all we can do, but we're doing what we can do right now. Um, and I, I agree with you. Good comment. Cool. Katie, Haviland. Um, two things. Thank you. Uh, one, I think anyone who has gone through Ancestry or .com or, or one of the genealog genealogy uh, programs to find out where you came from, there is such a mixed bag of something in every one of us you know, so to say that I'm white or I'm whatever, uh, <laughs> we're all that, that mixed bag. Um, my second is when you walk into a room or you come into your Zoom meeting and you look around the group and you see everybody and you'll notice, oh, Jackie stands out. She has this beautiful passion flower behind her. Hmm, I wonder what somebody else has. So you can't help, boy, you look at Judy Bond with her, her, her asteroid or whatever it is that's shining behind her in, her in her background. So when you walk into a room and you see a group of people, you notice, um, you know, Judy Reinhardt and you, Linda, are wearing the same aqua color. I, so you see color. You see differences. Uh, you see whose hair is white, whose hair is, is black, whose hair is blonde, uh, whose is long, whose is short. So we notice all these details about people without making a judgment about them. But somehow skin color gets in the way of what we think about someone or how we react to them. And I think, you know, if there were some way we could take the magic tonic that says, okay, so you notice all these differences, but you're not making a negative judgment about them. Katie, that's a really good point. So let me, let me ask a question of the group. Why is that, do you think? And, and to say implicit bias, is it, that's the easy answer. But think deeply for a minute. Why is that? I don't know the answer. I'm tossing that out for people to think about. I, I'm, I'd like to just say, I, I'm not going to respond to that, Linda, I'm sorry, although I'm thinking mm. about it. Okay. But I'm thinking about what we've been talking about and realizing even if we have, um, I find if I'm surprised that someone is dating someone other than is white, that I realize is implicit somewhere I think is implicit bias. Now, afterwards, if I make a judgment that maybe is positive or negative, there we go. But the very fact that it surprises me already has told me that I expect people who look the same or whatever to be dating the same. 
just listening, hearing it, I'm just surprised within myself, becoming aware of that reaction. So I think if nothing else, the beauty of our talking about implicit bias has start to sharpen our, our attune us to recognizing these little, oh, it never occurred to me. Why would it be an, uh, a surprise if someone dates someone who's Asian or black or, you know, this is the thing. So I realize, yeah, that's a place I need to smooth things out. It's perfectly normal. But at first, it, it hits me that it's it's not what I would have expected. So I think that's a bit of, for me, is a bit of an aha moment, just listening as we're talking and sharing together. Um, I do think though, and we're, you know, we have to make judgments all the time in order to, um, we get bombarded with so much information um, that we do have to kind of, we compartmentalize things just in order to to be able to navigate. I think it's what we do with those judgments, uh, the judgments we make with those that information that can get us into trouble. You know, if we say, for example, if we see an interracial couple, we can, we see, oh, you know, there's an interracial couple, but it's what, what do we judge it as? Oh, isn't that beautiful? Or, oh, that's awful. I think it's what we do with that information. I think that's a really good point. Um, and although you said you weren't gonna answer the question, you actually did. So thanks. Dottie, or is it Lou? First, and I think Lou next. Um, I'm a great lover of the American musical theater. And in the show by Rogers and Hammerstein, South Pacific, there is a song called, You've Got to Be Taught. That song, resonates with me very, very deeply because I agree with Jackie, we may observe something, it's what we tell ourselves about it and then what we do about it that makes the world of difference. All of us have been raised by people who have been raised by people who have somewhere, somehow, become frightened and fearful and want power or have no power, who have somehow created a reality that may not be valid. Jackie, you talked about gathering information. It's so very hard to know what's true nowadays. But I think that we have been taught to hate, we have been taught to fear, we have been taught to avoid even to be able to gather information about people who are different than we are, where are the opportunities and how do we make them? I know that I have been looking at my the way I live socially and looking at who is included and not included in my social network and my support system and are very aware that I would like to make changes and like to grow and learn much more about people who are different from me but I really go back to you've got to be taught. I think the other side of that, <clears throat> there was a series on PBS recently called Hacking Your Mind. And what they basically addressed was there is an automatic system and it's pro-survival. When you see a tiger in the jungle, you don't wanna have to stop and think, what should I do? You should go tiger run like hell. And we have that built in. And the only way we can overcome this is to consciously slow down you're going to get that initial reaction from something that you were exposed to or something you've been, been taught over years. And what you have to do is stop and slow down. This is something that's wired into us to react first, survival, and then say, maybe that was wrong. And we that implicit bias is there. We were, we were, it was, it was bred into us through evolution. And we have to simply say, okay, I recognize this, but I'm not going to act on it. I'm going to take that effort to slow down. So, oh my God, it's a black man. No, no, oh, it's a black man. Okay, good morning. That takes a second step. Thank you. I, I think the, those are insightful comments. And um, one of the things that you said, Lou, reminded me of the Verna Myers video that we asked people to watch. 
<clears throat> and she made a, a major point of saying she's got lots of experience with black men. And so she can tell at a glance if a black man that she sees is one to be feared or not. I think as, as a white woman, I need to not only understand and learn about other groups that are different from me, but I need to be able to distinguish something truly fearful from something not. And that requires what Lou was talking about, a pause for a minute and, and think about this. And, and I'm saying that because I'm doing it myself. Um, but I think it's a process. And I think that, that we need to continue to work at it because it's not a product. You don't get to an end and now we're finished. Um, so thank you for those comments. Lisa. Just expanding on, because I was also going to bring up Verna Meyer's video, and and when you know that she said that white people prefer seventy percent prefer white in in studies that she's seen, and fifty percent of black people prefer white, fifty percent, and and she said um, we're we're keeping. You know, the diversity helps us thrive. And, and how she gave examples is if you see a young black man and she goes, I'm not asking you to take a risk if you feel just like what, what Lou said, you know, you have to assess if there's a, ever a risk in anyone you need, whatever color they are. But she goes, if you can, rather than just wave and smile, go deeper. I love that she said that, go deeper. And then she said, you have to stare at successful black men. She, she was talking about that. She goes, really study them, look at them. You know, the examples and the stereotypes are wrong. It's wrong. J J Joy DeGruy goes over this. She goes, our, our movies, our music, you know, you, you associate color with with things we have ingrained in us and she says we have to go find the authentic relationships and you do that by asking about them and creating a, authentic she she also mentioned that that you have to um you know stand against injustice when you see people saying unjust things you have to speak up but going back to, you know, that, that if you meet a young black man and see how incredible they are and you ingrain in, I mean, you instill in them that they are incredible and they have the ability to become great statesmen or hardworking, you know, fathers and incredible dynamic people, caring people. That's, you know, you can, you can do things to help a young black man, even at, as a white person, because you can, you can befriend them. You can have authentic relationships. It's just ideas. Thank you. Um, yes. I, I can't elaborate that at all. Well done. Espy. Yeah, I can't resist to make a comment about Lou and your comment earlier. What I got out of it is, yes, I think, generally speaking, we tend to be judgmental. Automatically say, hey, you know, he's this, he's that. And so. so I, my uh, personal life, I try to undo that type of behavior. I have to unlearn it and says, oh no, wait a minute, I got to know and understand and so on and so forth. Now I was able to link that to, as I mentioned in our small group, the implicit bias that's created must have stemmed from our upbringing, the way we were taught when we were young and this and that, not to like this, not to like that, and the, different, the differences are no good. And the second uh, one is from our education. I don't know if the educational system really uh, emphasized that right from, you know, the earlier in school that uh, being different is good. You know, they have, they have stigmatized 
you got to be good here, you got to be good there, and that kind of differentiation. And the third one, I think, is our personal experience. If we had a bad experience one time and then we blanketed that all of them are like that. And um, I think that that's what I get out, get out, out of, of it, get out of that being judgmental, be open-minded, and I think we'll enrich ourselves and learn more about it. I work, I'm trying to work hard on it myself. That's a really good point. Um, I think that any of us who are, are attempting to understand and change the social climate are being challenged by how open-minded we actually are. Um, I, I suspect that if we did a little poll and said, how open-minded are you on a scale of one to 10 or zero to 10? Most of us would say, oh, eight or nine. Um, and I think that these discussion sessions are challenging some of that. So yes, we need to be even more open-minded than we may have been in the past. Jan Shepard. Yes, I wanted to say about our implicit bias that I can see that um, most of us are of a similar age, which is <laughs> the older generation. And, and um, racism was a lot more obvious in our youth. And, um, and I, for myself, my parents never said anything one way or the other about racism nothing, except they did um, express some distress that a black man was not allowed to move into the northern part of my small city because that was only for whites. And I grew up in Ohio, northern Ohio, which you would expect might be a little more open-minded, but it wasn't. And, um, and I re have realized that I got most of my implicit bias implicitly from my my culture and um the the part about 50 percent of black people preferring whites it it made me remember that i've i've had um i've suffered for being a woman um and there was a time in my life where i only wanted to hang out with men because i saw women as lesser and part of the uh, losing team and I wanted to be on the winning team so it doesn't surprise me that that black people want to be on the winning team which is defined as white in our culture and um, I also have had a lot of different experiences as an older person now we talked about it in my group but um, one of the things that made me think about how different life is today. I have a friend who's a black man and he asked me one time, would you ever have dated a black man when you were a teenager? And I just outright said, no, it would not have been a good thing for me to do in, that, in, in my teenage years. It would have been a terrible uh, consequence for my culture. I don't even know how my parents would have taken it, but I think they would have been afraid for me. So. And then the other thing is is um, the bias we still see on our TV, because every morning when I watch my local news, there's a shooting in a black neighborhood. So are we surprised that we're a little afraid of black men? Really? You know, where's the positive stuff about black men are good fathers and, and good workers and you know, this is not the majority of news that we get on TV. So um, that's my comment. I think that's a good point, Jan. Um, we know, Dottie said we have to be carefully taught and, and we are at the knee of our families, but we're also at the mercy of the media that we see. Um, movies, art, statues, um, whatever. And that image of, or that association of not just black men, black people are violent. They are coming from shredded families. They've got all kinds of things going on. Um, 
And I'm not convinced that, that that's true of the vast majority of black people. Um, and I, I will share with you an embarrassing realization on my own part. Years ago, I read a book called Warriors Don't Cry. If you haven't read it, it's, it's an interesting book. It's a memoir written by one of the nine students who um, integrated Central High School in Arkansas after Brown versus Board of Education. And in reading the book, I was blown away by the very idea, the, the obvious notion that these were, were children, they were high school students, but they were children who were being threatened from every direction and there was no one to turn to. They couldn't turn to the police because the police were threatening them and they couldn't turn to teachers because teachers didn't want them there and they couldn't turn to administrators. So there was nobody in that context that was, was going to protect them. I thought of that in the context of my own children and thought that that's just not acceptable. But I think the most shocking thing for me and the embarrassing part here, what those students had was their families and their home lives and their church people. And I read that and it flew in the face of everything that I saw on the news or read about black women are raped by their uncles and the family is in dissolution and there is no support. The thought that I had was that could have been my family and it stopped me in my tracks. So implicit bias and where that comes from can be changed, but I think you need to be able to engage it very directly. Judy Reinhardt. Yes, ma'am. Um, so good to see you, my friend. <laughs> right, it's so good to be here. I'm thinking more globally and there is implicit bias in what children are being taught in the history books. And I'm very aware of this 1619 project. And because of that, I found a book on Amazon called Before the Mayflower, A History of the Negro in America, 1619 to 1962, written by Larone Bennett. And when I read that in Africa, before these people were put on slave ships, there were sometimes black pharaohs and white pharaohs. And there was no difference in who was in power. That blew me away. I always assumed that pharaohs were all white. They were not. Swahili is a more sophisticated language than any other language in the world. And apparently the words in the Swahili language, they can talk about nuclear fission with the words that they had in their language back in Africa. So, um, you know, we are all educated in the same system, you know, and then when the slavery comes into this country, other countries have allowed people to come into society and be equal. You know, South America, black, white, I think they probably intermingle and there's no problem. So our freedom, all men are created equal is in really harsh contrast to what the reality is for the African-American in this country. So. Globally, I think implicit bias in education sort of forms all of us. I think you're right. And, and we all know that there's a discussion going on right now about what the history curriculum should be in this country. Um, I think those of us who come out of education need to, need to be aware of that and, and engage in it. One, one point that I, that I think needs to be made here, we're talking about implicit bias think of that as a circle over here, and we're talking about racism over here, they are not the same thing, although they clearly overlap. So you want to think about implicit bias. You could have biases in a number of ways. They have nothing to do with race or, or ethnic differences. 
Um, so we need to realize that implicit bias is not the same as racism, although it's clearly related. Lynn, Hunter. Yeah. Um, two things. Good to see you again. Thank you, nice to be here. Um, something that Charles had said, I'm glad they were old enough to have been in elementary school when 1954 Brown versus the Board of Education. And I remember the very first black child who came to my elementary school. I think I was in fifth or sixth grade and I didn't handle it very well. And now it, it has occurred to me over the years that they would put a black child in a white school and do nothing to help her to do anything about this enormous change in the public schools. I was in Baltimore 